Here I am. I am thrilled to be welcoming to Burlesque Galaxy the lovely, the talented, the legendary Julie Atlas Muse. Thank you, Bradford. It's a real pleasure to be here on the Galaxy again. Oh, pshaw, pshaw. Anyway, um, Julie Atlas Muse is a uh, a legend of burlesque, um, uh, but she is. Uh, has taken to presenting fantastical, magnificent uh, annual performances, uh, plays, muse musical plays. Uh, it's an, a British tradition called Panto. It's for children, but so you're wondering why Burlesque Galaxy is um, uh, discussing and plugging a children's production. It is not your average child's production. It is body, it is naughty, and it is kind of burlesque without the tits. That's how I see it. So uh, um, Julie is here to uh, talk about her, her, her new venture in life, which is this panto. Uh, which happens around Christmas time traditionally, but it's a British, British tr tradition. And enough of my babbling, let's get right to it. Julie, you know much more about this sort of thing than I do. So please enlighten me. What is Panto? Okay, so Panto is a 300 year old tradition that is uh, that stems from Commedia dell'arte, right? Uh, but it currently, I don't even know how I can put it. It's such a part of British culture. It's part of the reason why Monty Python exists. It's it's quintessentially British humor. It's at the root of so much Western comedy. And it's um, it starts in England at around November. The 10 shows a week in every town in their biggest uh, theater packed until about the middle to the end of January. So that's a three to four month run. Uh, 800 seat houses, packed, two, sh two shows a night, just crazy. It is the equivalent of our Nutcracker and Rockettes. It is their holiday show. And it's typically a, a fairy tale um, that gets popified, really. Um, and it's got extremely fantastic production values. Uh, very standard skits. It is vaudeville, it is burlesque, it is music hall, and it's for the whole family. It's not just for children. The, the trick for this form of theater is that it's, the kids will laugh on one level, the teenagers will laugh at the adult level because they'll just be being able to sit intellectually down or hum, in terms of humor at the, at the grown ups table. So, and then the, grandparents will enjoy it too just because it's fantastic when I Matt didn't tell me what it was when he first took me to one and we went to go see Cinderella and I could not believe my eyes my ears the there was such a call and like a literal call and response between the audience like there's arguments in the show and the dame or one of the principal characters will say like oh no you don't and then the whole crowd will say, oh, yes, we do. Oh, no, we don't. Oh, yes, we do. And then so there's this real punk rock anarchy and anarchy and unexpectedness and spectacle and wild fun with a good message that, well, with a strong message that good overcomes evil is the heart of this, you know, this Christmas fairy tale. It's so, so much fun. Ice cream for ice cream comes from that look out behind you comes from it. All of these Western comedic tropes really are a part of this form. And the first time we did it was Jack and the Beanstalk. And I literally did it from a book. There's books, there's books. And, and Americans don't know about this form. Is this pantomime for dummies or Americans rather? It's, I mean, it's called creating pantomime and it's how to put a pantomime together. And we pretty much, we tried to follow the book and it is so formulaic and it's so tried, tested and true that it worked, oh, it worked. I, I'm enchanted by that book. I have to see that. That looks oh. like such a fun read. It's um, so yes, I saw Jack and the Beanstalk, which was your, your first uh, panto. And you did that for how many years? 
we did it for two years. About 3,000 people saw the show. It was, which was really kind of exciting in New York. Uh, we did it for two years, uh, 2017 and 2018, I believe. We took 2019 off because I needed a break. And then, you know, we know what happened with 2020. What? What happened? It's the year that never um, was, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think that whole three month period, I was um, drinking and wearing elastic waistbands. Anyway, uh, so I saw Jack and the Beanstalk and it was everything you describe. It was ruckus and fun and it was an outlet for the kiddies as well as the adults. And, um, and the production was so uh, uh, frankly gaudy and colorful. And that's part of the formula too, I imagine. Absolutely. The dame is the uh, mother figure. Like, 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 look at that picture. Like, look, that's, that's, I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a kiddie pool as part of the dame's outfit. Oh, that's marvelous. In the book. So it's about fun. And the dame is always played by a man. Um, and there's cross-dressing. There's people dressed up as animals, animals dressed up as people, pie fights. There's always a splosh scene. Hopefully in our next show, Dick Rivington, the cat, I'm working on doing a pizza pie splosh scene. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's everything as fast as you can. It's, 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 it's a lot like, I, I feel like, you know, working at the slipper room is a lot, is good training. Working in burlesque is good training for Panto. And there's a lot of crossover. Like our good fairy last time was the international burlesque sensation, Dirty Martini. So that really tickled my tickled my heart that dirty you know known for her legendary strip tease was the force of good for these children <laughs> um the stripper is the force of good as always oh, yeah. um do you want to embellish a little on that crossover of of panto into burlesque how they relate it's comedy you get a group of drunk adults in a room on a Saturday night and they're like a bunch of kids. It's the same kind of dealing with attention span mm -hmm. with trying to get them to misbehave in the way that you anticipate and the way that you encourage as opposed to, uh, you know, just letting it be disharmonious anarchy. You want it to be harmonious anarchy and you want that, that good feeling. It's the same feeling really, except for, you know, you just can't show titties and the double entendres you can't wink. You gotta just do it as a double entendre. Like ours is Dick Rivington and the cat and all the dick jokes are sincere. You know, like they're all, they all have to be played sincere as opposed to like the way that I would play that at the slipper room, which is a little more of like a... <laughs> was that a lollipop? What was that? Anyway, um, as a parent, it's funny because children get excited be when things are naughty and it's very naughty on their level so they're very excited that they're able to be that naughty with the grown-ups right next to them having to go along with it that's exciting for them but then on the flip side is the fact that those dick jokes are really naughty i mean the, they're like it's like butt fucking jokes <laughs> right in front of the children and they don't it's all in code and that's the thrill for the adults it's the same thing on the reverse we're excited that we get to share this dirty moment and the kids have no idea it's like we all get a little bit of that um thrill of being naughty in the presence of either the parent for the kids mm. or the kids with the uh, parent. And that's, I think the, the key to good entertainment, you know, good, clean fun. Mm. And, and fun is, you know, the key. Like Bugs Bunny was an asshole. Like he was a jerk, but he was super funny, you know? So I don't know, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm nervous, um, but I'm really excited. I, I'm so grateful. And to do it in a space like Abrams Art Center is a real gift. 
it's a 300 seat venue. It's traditional. Mm. It's, it's just, it's just great. I, I just can't, I can't wait. It's very, it's a very, very special time. I'm curious to see how we're going to move forward with, you know, um, you know, COVID regulation, but I feel like hopefully by December, will be kids will be able to take off their masks and scream at the audience because that's important the mm. kids have got to be able to yell back at the stage yeah well there's when matt took me when matt took me to my first one in england i was like i was blown away i could not believe it it felt like a punk rock concert that lasted for two hours but there were little miniature ponies on stage <laughs> like alive it was unbelievable it was unbelievable so cool yeah. it's such a cool form well, the show that you guys put on was so magnificent and so fun. I couldn't recommend it enough. And as I did, as I did recommend it to countless people, not just parents, especially parents, but uh, everybody, it was such an unbridled ball. I just loved it. So campy, so hilarious. And, um, and that's the thing, like you said about Bugs Bunny being an asshole, pretty much most of the people in the cast are assholes, but they're lovable assholes. Yes. I, love I just that. want to add that, like, you know, Matt grew up with the form and I wouldn't be able to do, I wouldn't be able to create a sincerely, seriously, I wouldn't be able to create the pantomime without Matt. He understands it. I don't get it. I err on the side of too dirty because I'm trained in the burlesque world. He knows where to, where to ride that fence. You know, he really knows, he really knows what side to fall on for the most part. I mean, we're gonna have to cut a lot of the dick jokes. Uh, I hope you didn't hear that, but we're gonna have to cut a lot of the dick jokes. There can only be like like three dick jokes per act. I mean, there can't be like 14 dick jokes per act. That's just, you know, only one joke about throbbing veins, you know, not two. <laughs> I mean, enough there's gonna be like, you know, dick pics. Anyway. <laughs> oh dear more, oh god more dick jokes that's my policy especially in children's theater um all right so speaking of children's theater burlesque um so you are you started out as a um how did you start out were you a dance like a, a dancer like a modern dancer is that what you mm -hmm. said and then yeah, i came to new york as a modern dancer i wanted to be like in Palabolus. Or in Moomin Shots. Oh, Moomin Shots. Wow, you are old. <laughs> I, uh, I know well, that I... reference. Oh. <laughs> uh, my turn. Well, Moomin Shots was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Palabolus, really. Palabolus. I don't know Palabolus. that. <sighs> anyway. Well, dancers know it. Okay. I'm, I'm not even a mover. I mean, I can barely. So um, uh, you, where did you come from? Oh, Detroit, correct? I can't, yeah, I, come from, I came from Detroit. I went to Oberlin College in Ohio and then I drove to Alaska and then to New York City. Um, oh, and then the I was like, this is it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was on the way, so boy. Um, but it, and I, I, and I, I was like, New York City is my home. And it called to me. It called to me when I was a child. My parents came here for a conference and we saw cats when I was like seven or eight and like done. My life was like, my, 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 my path in life was just clearly laid out. And I was like, I gotta go down that road, please. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was, you know, when you, when you move to New York City and you're an experimental dancer, an experimental choreographer, you perform four hours a day, three days a week. You rehearse four hours a day, three three days a week in order to perform like once for free at a church. And it wasn't enough for me. I fell into drag. I saw some drag performances. Um, and then uh, Catherine Horahan asked me to do the Red Vixen Cabaret. And then that was it. That was done. I met Tigger there. I met Dirty there. I just, I was also working with Pink Ink, you know, just performance all the way around. And then, and that was, when, as world, the world famous Bob says, that was like 1998, 1999, when you could fit all of the burlesque performers in New York City in two taxi cabs. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I was a late bloomer. I didn't show up till 1999, 2000, around there. 
And I remember you, I, of course I remember you. I mean, I still, I still want a uh, ukulele Louie. Uh, I remember you practicing your ukulele songs. And if I interrupted you while you were rehearsing backstage, you would get so annoyed. Cause you were like really like trying to like learn your music and like go through it, cram it into your head. It's cause I barely knew how to play ukulele. That was the panic. Uh, it wasn't you, it was me. Um, I trust I was nice in my annoyance. Of course, no, I mean, but I wasn't nice in my annoyance. Like I took, you know, I was like, Bradford, Bradford, you know, I'm just trying to do my song. It's like Bradford, Bradford. Um, and then came, then came Bratwurst. Mm. All right, enough uh, about, uh, enough about in, me. Invisible Man, one oh, of my favorites. You're his only fan. Oh my I'm God. not. Mom. Oh God, but like, I got to tell you, two weeks ago today, I experienced while hosting at the Slipper Room, the great karma from me laughing at all of your failures from throughout the years. I mean, failures, like, you know, when you would crack a joke and no one would laugh except for like me and Dirty. Yes, there's so <laughs> many failures. I really, I really, I really paid, I really paid for it right after the Wiggle Room. I walked into the wiggle room. It was like the first Thursday after the pandemic opened. It was the first Thursday show. It was raining two weeks ago. I remember it vividly. It was raining. I didn't think anybody would be at the slipper room. I walk in at about 9.30. You're on stage. You're killing it. The room is packed. <laughs> Everyone's happy. I'm shut I, I can't believe that there's people here at the slipper room. Oh, there's hope that my first midnight show since the pandemic has a chance of succeeding. But no. <laughs> you finished? You, you introduced the next show? And then in like, I kid you not, maybe four to five minutes, it's like, it's like, like the, the room was vacuumed out of people. There was, <laughs> like, then there was nobody there. Now, now there were two to three people there. Five. Okay. There was a t table of four that were on the phone. They were out the door uh, during my opening number. Uh. They were on the phone. They were like making plans to meet up. Like, I understand. I don't blame them. And then there was Javi, that blonde bearded guy, a new guy who hangs out at the bar, and then one drunk walk-in, and then one other person. <laughs> and then that was act one. And Javi was, that's the only show that I've seen Javi be awake at. I mean, uh. Javi was alert, awake. He was just watching. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Javi Burgess is one of, you know, the legendary circus royalty that has his own table at the Slipper Room, keeps his milk in the bar, and is there every single night. He's like Santa Claus on vacation, and he falls asleep during the show constantly. But he stayed awake for your show. I think he was alert with morbid curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. God, it was horrible. Well, do, should we end on a, um, that, that's a dark note. That's a gloomy note to end on. Should we um, end on a, what about, what, what's one of your <laughs> showbiz triumphs? Uh, gosh, I didn't mean to go that way. I think that my next, you know, I, I have to say, I am looking forward to, Oh, my best, my one in my showbiz triumphs. All right. Well, I can say this. I'll say the longevity of the balloon. I have been getting inside of a balloon professionally, regularly since 2004. But I won the Miss Zada, well, regularly since 2006. I have two girls in Las Vegas performing a version of my balloon act. I have one lady in um, London performing a version of my balloon act. And sometimes one in Dubai. So I've successfully been able to franchise my balloon act and still perform it uh, on a weekly basis. And I have to say that is one of the greatest treasures that I have in my career. I am, you know, I've been around the world in 180 balloons. And so or actually probably like a, a thousand, 1,800 balloons. I've been, I've been in a lot of balloons in my days. And I'm talking about, you know, a 72 inch latex clear or black balloon. And I have two different numbers that are in my repertoire, but it's, that is the coolest thing ever. And yeah, that's, that's the, I'd say one of the pride and joys of my burlesque career. 
Well, I thank you so much, Bradford, for inviting me to on the Burlesque Galaxy. I'm just so honored to visit your atmosphere and to be part of, you know, your whole world. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you, the lovely, talented, uh, dreamy, legendary Julie Atlas Muse. You're the best. I love you. I'll see you soon. Signing out, Burlesque mm. Galaxy. Bye. Bye.